just give it a few minutes put about a minute poor people are just entering the room yeah. essentially essentially what we've done now is we've opened the doors and people are now coming in and getting their yeah. seats in this weird virtual world that we live in yeah that's mad how long have you been doing it virtually yeah. so we started um sort of when the pandemic hit so what march we went into lockdown and then, so we used to do face-to-face -face events every kind of couple of months and then we switched to zoom around sort of may april may um of the pandemic year 2020 isn't it um and actually what we found is it's actually quite enjoyable because people that can't make it to london like last week you know have their own way of engaging and, and, and how, often often how often uh every two months we try and do we try and do every two months um where we get guests a couple of your mates a couple of your ex-pros have been on dicko's okay. been on smudge yeah. has been on oh, okay. um yeah. yeah yeah they're good fun yeah, no, no, it's good, it's good. It's good fun. Right, just yeah. going to give it 30 seconds. I can see the numbers going up. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to all our members joining live and those of you who will be listening to the recording um, at a later date or the podcast. So let's just give it 20 seconds and then we'll, we'll mm -hmm. start. Hmm. But you've done a few of these, Paul, now, haven't you, <laughs> on Zoom? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it has been quite quite interesting doing this, and it's, it's been enjoyable because, you know, it's talking about yourself, really, essentially, yeah. and, and yeah. listening <laughs> to the fans' uh, stories is always, I always find that interesting as well. So, yeah, it's 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 been enjoyable, and Perfect. I'm looking forward, to, looking forward to this one. Good stuff. Right, okay, I think we're going to kick off, so... Hello everyone and welcome to another virtual event or a podcast depending on how you're listening to this you might be here live in the virtual audience or you might be listening at a later date but whatever you're doing we welcome you so we've got Arsenal legend Paul Davis here um, who has been busy in the last week or two I think it's safe to say um, we had him last week at the Tollington where we had hundreds of fans buying their books, having a chat with Paul. I think, Paul, you were signing for about seven, eight hours in the end, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Thanks, thanks for having me on, Anne, and it's a pleasure to be here and able to talk to everybody. And uh, Yeah, just it's just a pleasure to be able to spend some time with, with fans. And uh, last week was one of those strange uh, occasions, which, not strange, but... I didn't quite know what we were going to get in terms of uh, numbers and um, and, uh, and how long it was going to last. And like you said, there it went on yeah, for literally seven hours, and I didn't really feel it at the time. Um, but it was such a a nice atmosphere in in the Tollington, and mm -hmm. um, everybody that I spoke to, both you know, from family to friends who were there and fans um, and myself. Well, it was such a, a wonderful, warm evening. Mm. I, I definitely felt that and, and like my family did. So, mm. yeah, it was, it was great. It's just fabulous to be able to share with the fans mm. face to face, person to person. And um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to chatting to you guys again and yeah. Sharing, sharing my stories and hopefully yeah. you too maybe from yourselves. It was also nice to see a couple of your ex ex colleagues, ex pros there as well. You know, we had Smudge and Martin Keown and, and you know there's quite a few actually, wasn't there? Mickey Thomas, yeah. whose birthday it is happy birthday, Mickey. <laughs> All right, happy birthday, Mike. Yeah, it, yeah, it was good to get those guys along. Um we don't I don't know we don't get to see each other that much, you know. Mm. Uh, I, re I very rarely see Alan apart from on TV of course. <laughs> Um, Michael, I don't really, see, not any of the guys that you play with, you generally tend to see. Um, I suppose maybe the, the guys that work in the media, they might bump into each other a little bit more. So Smudge might bump into Lee a bit more. And, and so, yeah. yeah. But if, you, if you're not working with the media, which I'm not, it's kind of, it's very rare that we get a chance to see each other. So, yeah, it was great that those guys were able to come down. And one or two others that weren't able to come, but that was a good um, so I had for people that weren't there I, um, as you mentioned uh, Martin Keown and, uh, and he, he 
I haven't seen for a long time, but Martin and I room together, so like kind of we know each other quite yeah. really quite close. Alan, Alan Smith, as you said, came down. Um, then Michael Michael Thomas came across. So it's great to and then and then going back even further, you know, Chrissy White, you yeah. know, that can remember that sort of far back and Raphael Mead and Gus Caesar and one or two others. So it's great. It was great for them as well because they've not seen each other for ages. I've not seen yeah. them, so it's like you know, and they were really having a good time. Yeah. So it's like yeah. we, sort of re, uh, reliving stories. Yeah. And the thing about it, nobody has actually changed in their personality, you know. So that you know, the talkative ones are still the talkative ones, the quieter ones are still the quieter ones. So it's it, it's really interesting when you haven't seen people, um, colleagues for a long yeah. time, but then get back together. Ow. Yeah. How everybody just fits in like they were before. So we'll, we'll spend the next sort of fifty-five minutes or so, kind of talking about the book, reliving some of your moments from your career. Um, for those who are here live in our virtual audience, you can obviously use the Q and A function, or if you want, you can raise your hand. Um, obviously, because we've only got an hour, just kind of you know, appreciate you wanna sort of talk to Paul and stuff, but feel free to just raise your hand, ask the question and stuff like that, and then we can cover it. A lot of the stuff we obviously will be covering. Um, yes, we will cover the ban. Um, you know, Paul, I think that's what probably you've been asked the most. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, there is there is in-depth stuff of, of that in the book as well, so it, it's worth a read. But I guess, Paul, I mean, you know, after such a, what, 15-year career at Arsenal, 447 appearances, 37 goals, why now for the book? You know, why not a few years ago? Yeah. Why not wait a few more years? Why now? Yeah, so there's several reasons why now. Um, what, one of the main reasons is fans. Fans have come up to me ever since I'd stopped playing and asked me about, actually people have asked me, why, why have I not done a book? Where's your book? When's it coming out? So, you know, that, that's definitely one of the, one of the main reasons. And people have asked me questions over the years and continue to ask me questions about my career, my thoughts on certain subjects within the game, so issues within the game, my thoughts on, on, on how the game's going, particular, particularly in the area of coaching uh, and developing coaches, which, which is what I'm into right now in terms of my, my work, but also my, my thoughts on how the game has changed um, and just my experiences within the game and and also you know my I've got two young men now they're not boys they're young men who never saw me play and um, their their recollections or stories are coming from watching YouTube or listening to somebody else's dad telling them about how I used to play or what I used to do. Um, so a part of it was that, is that I wanted my, my son to really get, have something that they can really sit down and read and, and, and really find out what it was like to be a footballer and a black footballer as well. I really want to kind of share that with people because, you know, there is a story to tell there and I really want people to would like people to, to 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 delve into that and find out, you know, say, okay, so that's what that's what happened there, or that's what Paul had to go through. Um, yeah, and and I, I wanted, and we wanted to. I mean, I, I wrote, I wrote, we wrote the book with Tom, Tom Watt, who, who well, no, written yeah. quite, Most quite Arsenal, quite a few, yeah, he's written, written quite a few books. Big Arsenal fan, known Tom for a long time, and. It was right. It's the right time, you know. I've I've got to a stage in life where I can really just sit back and reflect a lot on what's happened, and um, maybe have one or two answers about why why things happen. And I feel that you know I want to share stuff with people that are interested to to learn about how difficult or how good life can be in football. So there's you know. There's some great moments in the book, and I write all that I'm talking about is detailed in the book. It's really detailed stuff, and I, I just wanted people to hear and feel how I felt in those moments in those different areas of my career. Um, so yeah, I've got. Was a lot it to hard to back, look back on? And I feel that there's a lot there that people can can really enjoy and learn from. 
was it hard to remember all those memories and what was Tom Watts kind of role in this a little bit? Was yeah, it to kind so of Tom, trigger? Yeah, Tom, so we sat down, this was last year, um, and we kind of just worked out how we were going to do it. So we, we sat down probably once a week or once every fortnight. Um, we jigged it around a bit. And um, it would just, yeah, Tom had a list of questions that he'd formulated and um, sort of from the start of my career going right through to where I am now. And we just went through each stage um, week by week. And then once we add it all down, or well, Tom had sort of gone back and written it all up and listened because he, he recorded a lot of it as well. Mm. Um, he started writing and he started writing it all up. And so that took him a long process of doing writing it all up. And then once he'd kind of written things up, he then sent it all across to me to read. And um, so that's where it became a little bit difficult because like I started reading through it and then started changing things. Because um, I wanted it to be my voice and my words and, and well, largely, obviously, it's my story. So I want, I want things, I wanted it to sound like me. So, yeah, I read it, read it through, made maybe a changes, adjustments, sent it back to Tom. You know, so it was, it ended up being a real back and fro process, longer, but, you know, it took longer than perhaps first expected it to but I'm pleased with the outcome of it um, it's, it's a, you know it's a true account of how I feel yeah all the words are my, you know it's my words um, and I've been as honest as I can mm. uh, there'll be points in the book that people will be surprised about I know that um, mm. shocked about um, interested about um, but it is my true versions of events, different yeah. events. Um, so yeah, it's 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 uh, it's been an interesting process making it, and um, mm. yeah, on the large part, it's, largely it's been enjoyable. I found, you know, we've I've got loads of clippings that I've had over the years. I've, yeah, my well, like newspaper well. clippings, or... newspaper clippings. Yeah. yeah, so Tom Tom's memory for games is. Like like most fans, fantastic, <laughs> you know. Like like you guys, are, uh, and I've said this before. You guys are like remembering games and stuff. It's just unbelievable, unbelievable. Yes. I mean, yeah. It, people tell me about my career, and I I, I don't remember that detail. <laughs> well, I, don't argue, I don't argue. I don't argue with them anymore. <laughs> if they say that I scored a goal in that day, I say, okay, fine. I, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. But there are parts that I do remember. Yeah, um, uh, really, I think really interesting. So the book is a mixture of, um, you know, the football inside, which has been a lot. And you've been successful, so there's a lot of that. But there's these other bits that I think we feel that people will be of interest to people. And people have asked me, and I haven't. And I've been because I'm quite quiet anyway. I don't sort of speak when I was playing. I didn't speak out to the press. Mind you, George didn't want us to. He didn't. Yeah. <laughs> to speak out but even if we could i wasn't i wasn't really vocal in terms of you know giving my opinions i had, I had opinions but mm. didn't um necessarily want to give them out to the press mm. but now now is the right time to yeah. Yeah. yeah so there's a few places um where where people can get the book obviously they can be uh, they can be found on amazon um, the Tollington, where we were last week, still have uh, signed copies. So if you are at the Fulham game on Saturday, feel free to pop in. And I've just heard that there's a website called uh, www.soccer-books.co.uk. If you go onto that website, there are around 20 signed um, books there as well to purchase. So if you do kind of want to guarantee your signed book, I'll probably go to soccer-books.co.uk right now, um, or, or maybe just after the event. Um, where you can get your book and then we will be giving away 10 uh, books which was we got signed by Paul last week uh, which the AST have purchased and we'll give them to 10 um, people that have attended tonight so at the end of the event when we've kind of clocked off 
we'll get our I will get our Zoom analytics out. We'll see who's joined, see who's lasted till the end, and from that we'll do a little bit of a prize draw. So you've got to be here, you've got to last till the end, and you will get hopefully you'll be one of the ten lucky winners for a book today. So that's where you can get the book: soccer-books.co.uk for signed copies, Tollington for signed copies, or Amazon for for normal copies. Um, Paul, if I take you back to your sort of start of your career and coming through the academy. What do you sort of remember of that time? Um, and also, you, you you mentioned it early doors. It, it is in the book. Um, you know, it, it's it's fairly clear. You 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 are a black footballer that came through. There weren't many in those days. I know Brendan Batson played a few times for Arsenal, but you were the first real regular. What was it like coming through the academy? You know, thinking I am a little bit different here, but I'm going to give it a go. Yeah, I, I wanted. Um that side of my story to come out and so that people understood the difference that was around them. So that, that sort of is described in the book around the fact that, you know, in those seventies, when I grew up, uh, really I was, you know, it was, it, 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 black players weren't in the game, generally speaking. So I was, I was fortunate that I was able to watch, um, Clyde Best, who played at uh, West Ham, who was a black player, and I could, as a young kid, I could see him and I could identify with him, and that kind of gave me confidence to to, to feel that I could now I could become a footballer. Um, but there wasn't many Clyde Best. I mean, I think he was probably, you know, he was probably the only one. I can't remember anyone else at that time in sort of um, English football. Obviously, there was people like. Pele um, is an international star, but back then in the 70s, you didn't really see international football that much yeah. after the World Cup, so you didn't really see them apart from big tournaments. Um, but yeah, so it was different. And you know, I, I feel those experiences do have an effect on you, as a, as a, and they have an effect on me as, as a young black person trying to make the way and the, the, the news of the time and the, the environment um, uh, culture was, was tough. Um, so yeah, I, found, I felt that for me, um, football was a way out. Because we, we came from a, a poor, poor family really. My mom worked and she was on her own. We had my sister, myself, and we lived in council flat in South London. And, and it was tough for, for mum to try and find the money to provide for us. Um, so I talk about all that, but um, there was a, an environment where um, you, you did feel, I, I, you did feel at times isolated because of the, the colour. Um, and, and I think I think people should know that. It's kind of, it, it is a, that's, that's how it was and it has to be said. Um, but, you know, I I found a way of, the football was a way out for me out of, I don't know, I don't know if we had, we had, it was poverty because mum was able to put food on the table, but we weren't like, we weren't uh, middle class. It was proper working class and, and, and um, we weren't able to get what we wanted. So yeah, um, but yeah, I, I found once I got to Arsenal, um, I never felt when I first came. I never felt that you know my colour was in any mm. had any issue, and I was probably the only black kid there mm. when I joined at thirteen. So, but I was aware of it, um, and as as I as I developed through the club and I signed apprenticeship at sixteen and then professional at eighteen, uh, professional at seventeen. I, I was always aware I was the only black player in the changing room. You know, it, it was kind of quite clear. Really. It was like it's just one of those things. You just and the humour and the and the, and the conversations are different. And I think because as well, I was young. I was coming into change room, which had older players in. You know, players like um, initially when I when I first started the players that. Um, Frank McClintock, you know, Frank had finished by then, but uh, Frank Stapleton, Errol Leary, Pat Rice, 
Sammy Nelson, um, that sort of age group, um, Bob McNabb, um, um, that generation um, who'd won the 71 World uh, FA Cup. Mm. Um, and of course, they we they come from completely different backgrounds to me. So the conversation didn't really fit in with my sort of understanding. So it was it was, um, it was strange. Uh, but I kind of just got my head down. Um, was determined to 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 be a footballer. Um, wasn't going to let anything kind of uh, deter me from that either on the field or off the field, that was like a sort of clear mindset I had. Um, and, you know, by and large, it was a pretty good, um, enjoyable time. Uh, I think, I think um, back then, trying to break through into the first team, was all, well, it's hard now, but it was pretty hard then because although the squads weren't big, I think when I first broke in to the first team squad, it was about maybe 16 first team players. Um, so it wasn't like it is now, like yeah. 25, 30 players trying to get into to the team. Back then it was like 16 you know, first team red sort of squad players trying to get in. So, But those 16 were always part of the team or the squad. So... The 11 that played very rarely changed unless there was a real bad injury. Yeah. So, although it was smaller, the squads, it was still difficult to get into. So, you know, to, to get into the squad at 17, I did really, really quite well looking back. Um, well, we'll talk about yeah. your debut and stuff in a second, but also just when you started to play and you started to play away from Highbury, especially. You know, was there much abuse? Did you feel it? Did you kind of, how did you really battle with that? We'll just, we'll, we'll close that sort of chapter off this yeah. question sort of thing. Yeah, that side of it is really interesting because we go away, we travel, you know, to all the grounds that mm. we travel to now, you know. Um, well, obviously the grounds are changed, but the teams, so we used to go to Chelsea. Chelsea was a terrible place for black player, obviously. Mm. Um, Sunderland, and Newcastle. Anywhere north is really terrible for me. I'd often be the only black player on the pitch for either team. And obviously, you're in front of their fans. Mm. And, you know, every time you, you touch the ball, it was just the old stadium was like, I mean, just making monkey noises or chanting. Um, yeah, it's like, it's completely reversed now. You wouldn't get that now. But back then, it, it, every other week, it'd be... 30, 40,000 people on you. Um, so you've got to really have a, a really develop a strong mindset to kind of try and block all that out and perform. And I think, you know, by and large, I managed to do that. Um, but, and I think you, you learn to block things out, I think. Um, and you have to, because otherwise, if, you, if you're listening in to all that, negativity on on you I'm the only one on that pitch and they're abusing me verbally um, got to find a way of dealing with it and, and carrying on and because um, back then you couldn't like go go and speak to the manager or anybody and say look I can't, you know, this is this is not on it was it was it wasn't against the law in it back then anyway it was like you know, people could it was just accepted. Was just accepted behavior. So, but you know, it isn't right, and I didn't feel it was right. It just, but you just got to deal with it. And so, yeah, just, just made sure that I had a, a good mindset, um, and, and just got on with it. Um, and then, you know, things over, and then one or two more players started coming in. So I. I I started off, so I, and one of the proud, one of the proudest things for me is looking back on my career, and just saying like, you, Paul, you were the first black player to establish him, yourself yeah. in Arsenal's team, and that is that's massive. And I, I, I it's only like finishing playing, I kind of really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and you know, look at our team now. You look at our team when Arsene Wenger was managing, and 
of the transformation in football. I'm really kind of proud that I was at the start of that and I had, I had, I had some part to play in, in the way that it's developed. And I said the other day, I think, you know, Arsenal, Arsenal fans now are more, more diverse than any other club in, in, in this country. Um, and I, I'm really proud that we've got a club like that because that's how it should be. And, uh, and, and it can continue even more so because, you know, that's, that's, the way the, that's, the way, that's the way the world is now. That's the way it should be. Um, so, yeah, the crowd, our, our crowd is multicultural. I look, in the stand, yeah. I look at the stand now and I think, well, wow, brilliant. Um, great, yeah. other, other clubs got that. We can, we can still continue on to, to push on and, and yeah. show more. But, yeah. Stephen, Stephen, who's who's here um, in the virtual audience, has asked mm -hmm. about kind of you were obviously the first, as you said, but did you kind of consider yourself a bit of a mentor then for the broke parcels, the Thomases, the Campbells coming through afterwards? And obviously, Rocky's family attended last week as well, so clearly, you, you know, they, they hold you in high esteem. Yeah, yeah, I do because I, you know, I, I, I did obviously when I was at the club at that time. I knew I was, you know, I just looked around the change room and, you know, I just, I'm the only black person there. So I, it stands out. It's not, it's, it's not an issue, but you just know. And, it, and back, like I said earlier, back then, culture was, you know, you had TV programs like just talking you know, disparagingly about black people. It's like just coming. And so it was, Inevitable that things like that spill off into life. You know, people copy what they see, and that kind of thing. But um, so, Chrissy White then joined. Raphael Me, Gus Caesar, they're sort of closer to my age. Yeah, they kind of come come into the club, and so, but they don't stay around for long. They, they their careers kind of mm. peter off. But I'm still there. You know, and then, Dave Rollcastle and then Michael Thomas and then Kevin Campbell and then Ian Wayne and then the list starts getting bigger and bigger and there's many others that I haven't I haven't mentioned here but um, they've all had a part to play in that um, so yeah I, I do feel I do feel uh, lucky that, that I and, and that I've taken that opportunity that was there for me and hopefully I've been able to be that role model for those other guys to um, to aspire to. Like I had the role model of, of um, Clyde Des, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And they had the, me as a role model as they were coming into the club mm -hmm. and looking up to me. And I always felt when they were coming through that they needed, if they needed me, that I would be there. And they knew yeah. that. But they could look after themselves, you know. They, um, in the early days, there was a couple of off-colour jokes to me, and I, I stood up to it. And I talk about all this in the book in detail in terms yeah, of no, stuff it. that went on. But, um, and I think you have to... Um, people deal with things in different ways, I suppose. I was always feeling that I have to challenge. If, But I, I didn't challenge everything. I just felt you have to weigh up. What yeah. you challenge and how you challenge it. So there's always this 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 kind of um, battle going on in your mind. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been a fabulous um, journey for me, both mm. from a footballing point of view, but then also this kind of life you know, learning about how to deal with different things. So let's talk debut. Obviously, it's you know it, it it's a dream to play for Arsenal. I think anybody would just love to play a minute for Arsenal. You obviously had the debut, um, which well, many people probably wouldn't want actually, and it was Tottenham away. I mean, if there's ever a game where you're going to get abuse, generally, no matter what colour you are, you're going to get. If you're an Arsenal show, you're going to get abuse at Tottenham. Um, what was that like, and what are your memories of the day? Yeah, I've got some vivid memories of of that actually. Um, you know, getting picked to play, getting, you know, your name read out by the manager then was Terry Neal. Um, and he, he, he wanted to rest some of his key players um, for the coming weeks because we had some important games in the FA Cup and Cup Winners Cup. 
and he wanted to rest people like Liam Brady and, and Frank Stapleton, who were key players at that time, and, and just bring in some fresh, fresh players. And I was one of those. So um, when when he named the team on the morning of the game, um, obviously you know just deli- you know delighted, um, excited, um, but ready for it. Really, I was I was I was ready for the, the opportunity. But it was well, it, back in those days, no mobile phones. You're talking about 1979. Um, I wasn't able to contact my mum. He was in stock. It was in South London, so none of my family actually came to the game because I only, I only knew the morning of the game, or yeah, late morning. I mean, kick off was at three o'clock. I don't. This is another thing. My my, my family over the years when I was playing didn't feel comfortable going to grounds. It was that sort of that sort of situation. Um, it was back families. It was uh, nervy where he went, and so that was another thing. You know, throughout my career, I always was wary of family, mum, sister, going to grounds because it was depending on where you played. Obviously, Arsenal it was comfortable because it's home, and I didn't yeah. think there was danger there definitely. But then any anywhere else, particularly north, it was. It, it would be like a risky thing to do, so they never went. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, it was tough, but I think because I was so single minded, pushed a lot of any sort of distractions out of my mind. Um, I learned very quickly that to be successful. You have to have an ability to just block things out and just push them to the side. Things that are not going to help you to get there. And I say that I say this to a lot of young young players who, who I you know, work with or come across, and they ask, um, you know, "Have you become a professional footballer?" So, yeah. Got to have ability for sure. Yeah. Got to have a sure that helps. <laughs> that does help. Yeah, the mind side of it. Is such a big, big side of it. Um, how do you get over the dis- disappointments? How do you get over injuries? How do you get over somebody criticizing you? Um, how do you get over um, bad performances? Um, and how do you get yourself back quickly into that positive mindset? And there's you know thousands of people, millions of people watching you. And I try to kind of get all this into the book because I feel that. I didn't just want it just to be about the football inside because yeah, that's yeah. great. All the winning, the trophies, and how we did it, and that's all explained. But I want that. I want people to get how, how we felt about it, how I felt about it, and what, how we did it, how we actually won trophies, how we got that team together, how George pulled us together, and how we pulled ourselves together to win win stuff. I want people to hear about that. Mm. I also want them to find out those other sides to how how, how did how did we do that. Mm. Why did that happen? And how, how was your response to that? And it's kind of mm. that's where that's really what I hope the book people get from the book is mm. those kind of details um, throughout my career. And sort of you know when we talk talk trophies, and of course not going to go through every one. There's lots, and it's in the book. But you know, eighty seven and eighty nine, where obviously we're injured, but ninety one as well, where I think you only missed a game, but how how glorious was that period but also how did you kind of keep your feet on the ground as well would it have been easy just to, you know I've made it now I'm a superstar and, and stuff like that but how did you kind of keep it going you know and keep that longevity because you were here for so long yeah so uh, the, the winning the winning side so we, we won in 87 George's first year mm. and then once once you get that first win and you know you can do it as a group and individually you know you're, you're capable of doing it because you've done it then it then then and you know what it feels like that is the thing and so then now you can go on and we did we did do we, we went on and we won won i won six six um trophies with arsenal um and you build it you build a togetherness a team spirit um, 
organization um, and there's a bond there between you um, that, that I don't know you have to be a really good manager to bring it together and then to keep it going and I think it's good management that keeps it going because we it, depending on the players it can it, it can get to your head um, yeah, and the manager and the and the staff are the ones that, and particularly if you're young, young players, it, you know, it can get to you. I think mm. having good senior players around and good management um, around helps to kind of keep, as you say, us about keeping your feet on the ground. I think personally, I've always, always kind of tried. I've just naturally keep a level playing for England. Not from a personal level, I don't. I don't feel as though I get too overstated yeah. on the wins. Um, I try not to get too disappointed on the defeats, but you do. You go, you dip. You know, if you, if you lose, you get you are disappointed. And there's no, you know, you just got you just got to deal with it, and then go forward again as quickly as possible. Uh, same as you know, you win, you enjoy the win, but then you got to come back to go for the next game. I think it's that kind of this mindset, get into that mindset of not too high, not too low, but enjoy the wins and accept the disappointments but come back again. It's kind of trying to get, get that in your head. Um, so, yeah, I think that's how, that's the best way. And I, I kind of talk about that again in the book, the detail of it and how we did it at Arsenal with, with the players that we had and how George got us together. Um, and, and, and how we turned us into a winning team um, and how the fans how we connected with I'll talk about how, how we connected with the fans back then you know often we knew a lot of a lot of the fans by name um, and they they'd come up be able to like off the coach get our autographs it was, you know they were like you could touch you could feel our fans yeah. back then um, and that's that's very that lives with you, you know, those kind of things. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm not so close to it now, but I don't know if they can do that, the players, I don't know if they can get so close to the players. Quite now. different now. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we had, we had some great moments with sort of getting to know fans um, quite well. Yeah. And that bond, I think there was a bond between us. Um. So, in amongst all the successes and trophies and great games, there was obviously an, an incident that people do remember, um, which led to, 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 to a bit of a ban. And actually, I read that I read that bit again today, actually, because I quite enjoyed it the first time around in the book. And, and for people who are listening who haven't quite read the book, it is there in detail. But to be fair, there have been questions about it. So, what, what happened? What happened with Glenn Rockwell that day? And, and what... You know, uh, most things, most people have said is, what did he say to, to make you kind of do what you did? Okay, so I won't ruin it for people that haven't got the copy of the book yet, and, and those that haven't read it, but it's, um, and it's in more detail when you do read it. But essentially, um, I'd played against, we played against each other many times before this incident, um, and we'd never ever had a crossword. It's very competitive, but nothing. On this particular day, it was um, I, I felt that he Glenn, Glenn Coco was you know, just making rash tackles, going over the top, leaving his foot in, uh, moving his elbow in. You know, basically, I just thought he was trying to hurt me, damage me. And this kind of went on throughout the game, first half, and didn't feel I was, I was getting any protection. Um, and the, the frustration of it all was building up in my head and totally out of character second half I did something that I to this day regret I, I hit him um, while the play was the ball was somewhere else I hit him and he went down um, from that moment my, my life changed because it was on the news the, the actual incident was on news at 10 um, it was everywhere in the newspaper, front page, back page, um, it was on the radio, and it was all negative. Like, this mm. guy has got to get banned, 
this can't happen in our game. You should never play for England in the game. It was that kind of media school to me for literally you know, two weeks. Um, so yeah, it was it wasn't um, the best part of my career. It changed my career. Um, I talk I talk about that. I talk about how it changed my career. I talk about how it, it you know sort of sent me. I don't know if I was in depression. I don't know what it was, but looking back on it, what I wasn't in a great place for a long time with that. Um, um, yeah, I talk about how how it affected me, and, and, and how the club helped me. And we talk about um, the ban itself when the FA did ban me for that because it was it was um, at the time nothing like that had ever happened. You know, somebody. A player, because um, they call it trial by TV. So it was the referee didn't see it, nine of them didn't see it, and if, if perhaps they had seen the incident, they would have sent me off, and that would have been it. It was been mm. so. The fact that they didn't see it, um, and then it was caught on a, on, a, on a news. It was a news TV crew that were filming the game, and it was just caught at the bottom of the, the screen while they were talking about the game and then it just went mad it was, I've, you know, I, I've um i hadn't experienced anything before or after in my career that was quite so traumatic in terms of um, you know, the attention that it got um, mm. it was in the house of commons they were talking about it, it was like it was crazy um but yeah that was that was something that um like I say, it goes into detail in the book, but it's it, it's something that a lot of people have asked me about because um, it's not my personality. Why did you yeah. stop it? It's not you. It's you know. But yeah, it was it was a build up of frustration and, and snapped. So but I wouldn't recommend retaliating. It's not the way. Not in that way anyway. Zach, I'm gonna be keen to get some member questions in. Um, I can see there's a few there. I'll give you sort of two or three, maybe pick the pick the best ones. Some of them have maybe covered. Absolutely, and we've answered quite a few. I think there's two maybe pairs of questions, so we'll do them in pairs. Perhaps the first one specifically about trophies. Mark said he remembers his first trophy was the Littlewoods Cup final win over Liverpool. What are your memories of that day? And then related to that, Neil has asked about your memories of Copenhagen '94. And then you touched on it before about the fans, but you said how much when you cross the line. Do you feed off the energy of the fans, or will you very much shut it out, play the game? Yeah, yeah. Um, those those two finals, the the uh, Woods and the uh, Copenhagen. Uh, yeah, I think any finals that like they're always they're the big the big ones because they want, there's the build up to it. There's all the, all the excitement, the anticipation of it, and uh, you, you know you can feel it. You can feel the fans looking forward to it and, um, and that feeds on to us you know we, we know how much it means to the fans to, 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 to win things well we feel we know you know um, and it's just that anticipation of the final um, and the big day out and the big excitement but still you know it's business you still want to win it so it's kind of getting that balance as a player and, and, and understanding that uh, fans are excited for it, and and, and they're excited. You're excited for uh, the fans are excited for every game. You want to win as much. Yeah, we want to win every game. But finals are finals. Like this is it. Um, so those two games, particularly '87, Little's Cup, was massive for us because it, like I said earlier, it's a the chance for all of us at that stage to win our first trophy. Um, it's against Liverpool, big team. Um, lovely day out, Wembley fans, all the driving in, Seward fans on the coach. Um, they sat on the coach and it was a nice day, sunny day, I remember that. And yeah, to win it, first trophy. I talk about I talk about how the planning of it, the, the um, preparation, how we how we go about it in the book and then the celebrations afterwards talk about it. Copenhagen, again for the same similar sort of reason. I mean, that's, but this time we're traveling away. Um, 
be honest, I talk, I talk about it. It's the team that we had, we had to put out that day wasn't we all knew it wasn't the strongest because of the injuries and suspension. You know, key players missing. And um, they for the first 15, 20 minutes of that game, Palmer right everywhere, like just all over us running. <laughs> I was there. I remember. I remember thinking, "Wow, if we can, if if we can last these 15, 20 minutes and just, I don't know, how we did it." And like they missed, they seen and made some good saves. They missed some good chances, and it was still nil nil after twenty minutes. And it shouldn't have been. They should have been like two two up. And um, but we had the team at that time, and the way George had, had us playing was that we could we could stick in there. If we stuck in there, we we knew we could nick goals. And it's difficult. It was difficult. To break us down, and that, that's exactly what happened. And then the celebrations afterwards is brilliant. Talk about being in the changing room. Talk about celebrating with the fans that were there that day. The fans were brilliant. Um, and, and yeah, talk about how we celebrated afterwards as, as a group. Yeah, those 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 um, finals, are just memorable days. Don't forget, them. as for fans as they are for players. Absolutely. And I'm sure that that's, as you say, that memorableness, that happiness, you can just see with the smile on your face. I'm sure there's many people listening at home with a similar sort of feeling to that warmth you're sharing. And the other pair of questions I want to ask is about your relationship with your teammates and particularly on some of those more challenging issues that some of them we've already discussed this evening. So a question from Mark, did you ever discuss with your teammates, particularly your white teammates about racism in the game? Was that something discussed? What was their reaction? And a question from John, who says there's a show on Sky at the moment about where Tony Adams is talking about his drinking and the drinking culture at Arsenal. Were you ever encouraged to join that? The stuff you're hearing now, years on, does it tally up with what you remember? Are you surprised by the extent of some of the things? I mean, Paul Merson did a great show and book about this this year. I'm just wondering your perspective on that. Yeah, yeah, great, great questions. I mean, the one, the question about, um, uh, did we discuss that? That's a good, really good question. No, we didn't. Um, you know, did, 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 um, did we talk about, you know, how we felt as black players or, and did the white players ask us about how we felt about what was going on around us? Yeah, no, we didn't. We didn't at all. We just kind of just, just plowed on. We just kind of just kept it to football, really. Um, and um, I kind of wish that we had, really. I think um, it would have been better for all of us to have some discussion on it because it was something that was affecting us. It was affecting me. I know there were black players. I don't know how how it affected the white players, if they were affected at all. But I think um, it would be it would have been nice to have had some questions. How do you feel about that? What you know, is there anything we can do? You know, just kind of something. But but then you know, when I first started, it was just part of life, so people wouldn't. It was, just, it was kind of just taken for granted, like you, you'd be abused walking down the street, perhaps, or you know, it's just, it's just people didn't really care about it too much. But as as we've kind of gone on, people see, um, I think, having conversations and talking about that part of life is 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 really important. And I know it's difficult at times for people to. Talk about these things, but they do affect people's lives. And if we can find a way of just just um, talking about it, not necessarily trying to convince people, but just saying like, "This is this is what's happened. This is how I feel." Um, I think yeah, I think we. It's a great question. I've never I've never had that with a teammate, which is um, sad, really. I think I think we should have been in that place where we should we could have we should have had. Those kind of discussions. But I don't. I don't know if it happens now. Even I don't know if um, players do go and talk about it. It's kind of such a tough. I think it does. I think it does. Yeah. Paul. I mean, we we had Granite Shaka on one of these events um, 
sort of last season talking just generally about online abuse and abuse. They talk about it. They talk about their kids. And obviously after Bakaya Saka came back from the Euros after missing the penalty, it was, you know, the abuse he got. And there was lots done about that. And I know Arsenal as a team, as a club actually do, do, do a fair bit around that. And I think players are quite open about it, which is great, obviously. It's, yeah, it's shown that the world has gone the right way. Yeah, yeah. And the other question was um, the drinking. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm I'm not a big drinker. I've never been a big drinker, but yeah, we did have some guys that like to drink. Back then. <laughs> was, again, it was a culture of football. They, they weren't the only ones. Uh, the club, the, the, you know, um, other clubs, other players did it. And it was just not, that was kind of the normal thing to do. You you go out as a group on a fight uh, Tuesday. 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 Tuesday club they called it and. Um, and you were under pressure to go, really, more so for team spirit. If we all, if we, if a night, if a night was planned out, then you were all expected to go, even if you weren't a drinker. And we all went. I went. I'd go. We'd all go. And uh, yeah, but I would not stay when it got too late or it got a little bit messy. I kind of got ducked away because that wasn't. I didn't really enjoy wasn't that part of it. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, there was there was um, a drink. I don't know if it's culture, but it was it was football. You know, every club had, had drinkers, um, and then what would happen was we'd have Wednesday off off of training, and then coming on the Thursday, and everybody would be suffering a little bit because of it. The manager would know that people had been out or had a drink, and would want them to kind of. Could sweat it all out and make sure it's out of the system. Mm. So Thursday would be a hard day um, <laughs> just to get this all this, get out of system. All this yeah. uh, alcohol out of the system ready for Saturday. But yeah, I, I wasn't I wasn't really part of the drinking side. But I, I did go. We did go out. We had nights out, and um, um, the guys had a good time. It's good. It good That's what, one more. One more, and then we'll. Just one, one more, more question. Way. In fact, I'm going to link two together because, again, they go well, so well together. Reflect you on your career. Um, Stephen says, obviously, now we don't talk about midfield as we have sixes and eights and box to box. How would you describe your position now? And link to that, Nicholas said when he watched you, he would compare you to Iniesta or Xavi of today um, and said you've got like that real technical ability. Obviously, you played abroad very briefly at different points, but he says, did you ever consider going abroad would your style of football have suited that yeah. so I, I would consider myself as um as a number eight in today's money so i'd like to be more attacking number four is a more defensive type type player um and i because I, I i was i was a striker when i was a kid and i scored Loads of goals. I was like number nine. So Love scoring goals, and yeah. As I, when I joined Arsenal, they kind of slowly got me back into midfield. But I was always attacking minded. I always felt, saw myself as attacking. So I would see myself as number. But I could I could defend as as well, and I could tackle. Of you know, I learned that side of the game. Uh, but my natural instincts is a number eight passing. And, and getting forward and creating that's how I saw myself um, I think under George I played a lot although my number was eight I did sort of play as a number four really just more conservative old in role um, so sorry sorry Zach what was the other question there it was about whether you obviously your style of football would have fitted in abroad did you ever consider playing abroad a bit more than you did yeah, there was one. There was a, a period where there there was some interest from um, Paris Saint Germain and uh, San Jose. It was a strong interest, but nothing came of it in the end. And I didn't in my prime. I didn't 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 want to go anywhere else. Really, I didn't I didn't feel that. And why would I want to leave Arsenal, other than I talk about this in a time when I had a big fallout with George and I had, there was a lot of um, 
um, you know, difficult time and, and, and I wasn't allowed to leave in the end, but I would have done if, if, it, if, the, if I had been allowed. Um, but my style, I do feel that my style is, was a sort of um, European style of game. I wasn't naturally um, sort of getting into tackles, although in the end I could look after myself in tackles and I could, I could do that side of, of, of being a footballer. But my, my natural game was trying to get the team ticking along and receive passes, um, create chances for, for forward players, Wrighty and, and Alan Smith and, and the players that I played with um, even before that, you know, um, Charlie Nicholas and, and Frank Stapleton and, and there's so many that I've played with um, trying to find opportunities for them to score was one of my kind of attributes really. So that's how, that's how I saw my game. Where is that? Perfect. Um, I'm just going to sort of, we've only got a few minutes. I know there are questions that have been asked, but I promise you, if you read the book or if you're about to read the book, you'll probably get many of your answers in in sort of in the book. And, and Paul has gone into great depth. But just want to sort of end with your post career, Paul, because and it will be joked about it last week. And I think Tom joked about it, saying that he had to ask you, sorry, but Paul, what do you do now? You're doing so much outside, like in the game, but maybe it's not because it's not in the media. It's not in yeah. the forefront. But I mean, what 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 have you been up to since you retired? Yeah. And what are you doing right now? Yeah, so I've I've stayed in the game. I didn't go into management and coaching, the, um, and that is explained in the book. You know why why that why that happened. Um, I think people will find that, that that interesting. But I I've I stayed in. So when I left Arsenal as a coach, I went over and joined up with the Professional Footballers Association and did a lot of work with them around coaching, um, around developing black coaches and getting black coaches involved in the game um, and did a lot of work around that um, coaching coaching lots of players on their qualifications so coach players that wanted to do their qualifications we would do would help them do that and then I left there when I went to join the football association which is where I'm at now and I'm a senior coach developer which means essentially I'm working with senior players and that's how I really got to meet um, Nicola Teta and players like that uh, Gerard and um, Lampard that's those sort of players that you know, they're finishing their careers want to go into coaching they will come via the EFA and we will help them develop their coaching so I feel privileged to be in that position where yeah. I'm coaching coaches of that level and uh, still have to be in tune with the game, still have to watch the game, still have to know what's going on. Um, but it's kind of a little bit of a back, back seat, you know, up yeah. there. So people, hence why people always go, so Paul, what are you doing now? So that's like people don't know. So that, yeah. again, I in the book, it kind of explains the it's detail of it all mm. and, and, and uh, some good examples of people that I've worked with. Mm. So yeah, still involved in the game, still go to watch Arsenal, still got, still got a great affection for the club and the supporters. So hopefully um, the people read it and do take a lot from it. Mm. There's a lot of work's gone into it and I, I, I didn't, and I wanted to wait until this period yeah. so that I can think and reflect and give a true reflection of mm. what's happened to me and, and, and uh, share that with people because I think mm. People do want to find out just that little bit more than just you know, the game, the game itself, and not be it, it provides that. And just finally, you, you touched on Mikel Arteta. He's obviously you were lucky enough to have him involved a little bit. Um, what are your kind of views on the current team? And you know, I know you're telling me last week that you still got your two season tickets, and you tend to try and get to seven, eight games a season when you can with work, but. Views on the current team and the start of the season. It's yeah, been all right, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been been good. Yeah, like all the fans have been coming up to me and I've been listening to the 
uh, to the chance in the stadium and the atmosphere. Yeah, it's great. I think I think we're in a really good place. And um, obviously, top of the league, playing well. Um, I think Nick Nick Owl's done a, a, a really really good job. And even like last year when it wasn't working out so well and people the fans weren't you know so confident about it, I was confident that he's going to get it right. I was, you know, I'm biased because obviously yeah. I've worked with him. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen it, um, and he's learning. He's still learning. It's his first job. Um, pressure's on him to do well, but he, you know, he's, he's been a top footballer. I've, I've got every faith that you know we're gonna, we're gonna be challenging for us. Like, like I said last week, I don't see us winning the Premier League this year, um, um, but we're on the right tracks, and I think we've got some good players. He's developing us nicely. It's going to be, you know, there's going to be dips in the season. We'll lose a couple of games where people are disappointed and that's going to happen. But I think fans kind of should be ready for that kind of stuff because mm. it will happen. But stick stick with him. Right? He's, you've, got, you've got somebody there who's, like, who works with the best and he's he's, um, he's played for the club and he knows, he knows the game. And so, yeah, I'm really excited like the fans are. The fans are really excited. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan now. Yeah. I've got season tickets and, yeah. It's, uh, looking forward to it. Great way to end, Paul. So just a reminder, Paul's absolutely great book and I'm, I've, I've read it. I've read it from that. I've been busy since last week, Paul. I've been, been reading it all week. Um, you know, it, it's a really fascinating read. And, and as I said, I've, we, 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 me and Paul talked a bit about last week and we talked about how we're going to do this. And we, we, we've purposely not gone into specific memories moments because otherwise there's no point you reading the book so it, a lot of what we've talked about today is in the book um so you know i can see like the questions that were asked around specific you know 89 and things like that all in there all in there so remember you can get these from amazon um we will be giving away 10 a little bit later so if you are one of the winners, we'll contact you by email just to confirm your address and they will be there all signed. I've got them all under my desk. And I think Paul was signing them out about 10.30 at night and the, the, the tonic then. But they're all signed. And as I said, if you don't, if you want to guarantee your signed book, then head to the Tonington if you're at the game on Saturday um, or go to soccer-books.co.uk and they've got about 20 or so copies left, I think. So if you're quick, you'll hopefully be able to get one. But um I'm sure there'll be other opportunities to meet Paul in the future. So even if you can't get a signed copy, get one on Amazon. I'm sure there'll be opportunities in the future. Paul, want to thank you. Thank you for last week. Thank you for this week. Um, as we've said, we've got members who you know live overseas or out of London who couldn't make it to the Tonington, but they're here now. They'll be listening to the podcast and the recordings. And I'm sure they're uh, very grateful for your time on this kind of Wednesday evening as, as we record. So, Paul... Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I'll just yeah, just thank you. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking with you both now and last week. And uh, yeah, it's always great to sort of link in with the fans and the passion that you guys show towards us as players and to the club. Is and I think you know as we as we as we get older, you kind of value you value it and. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for everyone's support. I hope everybody enjoys the book. Cheers, Paul. Cheers.